Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for the opportunities we have to assemble with one another, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Certainly thankful for the prayer from Brother Jackie, the song leading from Brother Mark. Always appreciative of those that uh, support the services with, uh, with their service. Uh, certainly many things going on here at Sandyville. Today was a move-up day for our young ones, and a new quarter begins, and we're thankful for uh, Karen, Melissa, uh, Denny, and Danielle for teaching the last quarter, and we're thankful for the new teachers that we have coming in. We're thankful for uh, Brother Carl uh, taking on the uh, deacon role of, of the education and those things included. We're very thankful for him, and uh, we're thankful for some of the new teachers we have coming on board this year. Uh, we're always thankful for new teachers and those that have taught in the past as well that have uh, come back again to answer that call to teach again. We're so thankful for each and every one. Uh, there's nothing that can be accomplished with just a few. We truly need everyone in order to accomplish the Lord's work in the way that he wants it to be accomplished. I believe because of the water issue last week, the women's meeting uh, was postponed to this week. So uh, this evening before uh, services, there will be, I believe, a women's meeting. And uh, don't forget about the uh, clothing drive that is also coming up. If you can help and support that in any way, that would be very much appreciative. Appreciated. Yeah, many things. Hey, yes. Oh, what say ye this evening also? Uh, Maxie will be on, and we're very thankful for that uh, as well. Many things. Uh, I'll actually be out at church camp this week, uh, help out with singing week, uh, Brother Andy Robinson and, and uh, Dane Hamilton. I'm very thankful, and uh, I was just thinking about it. They actually have me doing chapel, which means I, I, I basically preach every day. And uh, I, I just thought to myself this week, if I can get a preaching engagement on Saturday, I could preach all week. <laughs> but I'll be preaching every day. Uh, it, it certainly will be a lot, but it'll be rewarding. It, I'm so thankful that I'm afforded that opportunity to be able to preach every day to those young people and try to make a difference uh, as much as I can uh, using God's Word. But very thankful for that opportunity. So I'll be out at camp this week uh, trying to help out as much as I can. And, we're thankful for all the individuals here that help out with camp, whatever weeks it is, and certainly that's a good thing. You know, this week I thought a lot about family. You know, we had the fair going on, and we had a, a little service out there, a little devotional, and I was thinking about families and how good it is that we have these family uh, units, and, and we really try to fight to keep our families together. But as I look at our country, I look at our society and culture, is certainly the devil is on the move. And certainly he's on the move against our families. Certainly we could say the devil is harassing our families. He's attacking the family. I think the devil is attacking marriage. And, and the devil is attacking Christian mothers. And the devil is, is attacking Christian fathers. I mean, the devil is attacking the home. And he certainly has no shortage of ammunition. As we look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All these are coming at our Christian families, our Christian homes. They're coming at our marriages. They're coming at our fathers. They're coming at our mothers. They're coming at our children. Certainly, the devil has no shortage of attacks against the home, against the family. And I think that if we would just rewind 50 years, it's not that the devil wasn't attacking the home back then. He certainly was. But as we look, it seems like the devil has certainly gained some momentum and it has had some success in relation to taking apart the home. Certainly we do the best in whatever situation we find ourselves in. There's a lot of things that can happen to the home, and, and I will say that there is no perfect family. In fact, we start looking through the Bible, it doesn't take too long until we see Satan trying to attack the family. You go back to Genesis, and we see Cain and Abel. We have two brothers, and what happens between those two brothers? We actually have Cain kill his brother Abel. Talk about family problems. You think about Abraham, Abraham and Sarah who are promised a child and, 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 and uh, we look at that situation and Sarah, she's like, I don't know if we can have children, we are, we're too old. So she says, you know what, let me bring Hagar into the relationship and they have Ishmael. And we actually see how that really creates so much of a rift within the family that Abraham actually has to tell Ishmael and Hagar to leave. We think of David and his home. And how he had many problems with some of his sons and some of the things that went on in his house. 
the family, even of faithful individuals. We think of David, a man after God's own heart. We think of, uh, we think of Abraham, uh, a pillar of faith in many ways. We think of the first family. The family has always been under attack and, and really always will be. And I think that we have to think about ourselves and our roles in the family and be committed to do the best that we can. But number one, I think about God and we think about Satan and Satan attacking marriage. You know, it doesn't take too long as we look out in our society and our culture to see that marriage is in attack in, in many ways, more ways than one. As we look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we start to see the idea of marriage unfold. In Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, the Bible says, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We see right there that we have male and female. And as Genesis unfolds in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 23, we start to see that God understands male and female are great complements of one another. And we see in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 23, we see the expectations for the home, leaving father and mother. We see male and female. And certainly when we start to look at just some of these basic ideas, so many of these ideas are under attack in our world. Just the idea of male and female is under attack in our world. Marriage is under attack in our world. We look at some of the rulings of our Supreme Court in the past. They have taken marriage and they have tried to redefine it. Not based off of what God says, but by what they want and what our culture says is right. Marriage has been torn down and redefined. Of course, no one can tear down the actual institution that God intended for it to be. But we see that all these things have been done around marriage. All these things have been done around the home. And how much has happened in the last 50 years in terms of the home under attack. Marriage under attack. Certainly we do the best in whatever situation we find ourselves, and there is no perfect home out there. I tried to point that out with David, Abraham, and even the first family of the Bible. But certainly we can fight for what God desires and what God wants. You know, when I was growing up, my dad said this multiple times. There are certain things that your dad says to you that just kind of stick with you. And, and it might be like an off comment, but, but my dad said this multiple times. He said, how many of your friends have parents that are together? And when I was growing up, it was just a handful. And now as we look around our society, could we even say that it's even uh, fallen from that point? is that marriage has been under attack for a long time. The definition of marriage, how marriage is defined, I think marriage has been devalued in our world and our culture. A lot of people aren't even getting married today because they don't see the value of it, the value of committing to others. They try to find their ways around marriage and they try to have these situations where they're living together but not married. And actually there's a lot of statistics and research on these types of things. Is a lot of people that live together before they get married. A lot of times it doesn't work out. A lot of statistics are now coming out because it's, became almost, uh, it's almost become the norm. Is we're not going to get married, we're just going to live together. The numbers are out. It doesn't work out well. What God has set forth works out well. Male, female, compatible partners coming together, raising the family. But certainly that marriage relationship is under attack. You know, marriages certainly fall apart. When the devil gets in there with temptations, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. But perhaps marriages are falling because we have just turned away from God in general. In Psalm 127 and verse 1, which we had read for us, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. If we are trying to have a godly marriage, a biblical marriage, the only way we can do that is by turning to God and following God's guidance and principles on the relationship which he founded. When we run away from what God has said about marriage, our marriages, I believe, will fail. I think about that. Psalm 127 verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. There's a lot of people that are running around and saying, we're trying to have a marriage, but they're not doing anything that the Bible says about marriage. Oh yeah, we're going to have a marriage, but we're not going to do anything that the Bible says about marriage. We're going to redefine it. We're going to tear it down. We're going to devalue it. We're going to find all these other ways around what God has actually said. And you know what? 
they fail time and time again. Perhaps the home is failing. Perhaps marriages are failing because we have turned away from God. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I truly believe that the Bible gives us all answers, either directly or indirectly, by principle, about what makes a good marriage, what makes a good mother, what makes a good father. And I know it's, it's perhaps easy to find the answers, and it's harder to apply. But isn't that the Christian life in general? The Christian life is hard. We think of Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where it talks about the narrow path and the broad way, and it basically alludes to the idea that the broad way is easy. That's why everyone's taking it. And the narrow way, it says, is difficult, and there are few who find it. To have a Christian marriage has its challenges. Great blessings, of course, great blessings, but having a Christian marriage has its challenges. Being a Christian father has its challenges. Being a Christian mother has its challenges. It has its difficulties, and we have to rise to those challenges and say we're going to face those head on. The good life has always been the difficult life. The evil life is easy, and that's why so many go down that path. To live the good Christian life, to to fight for those things, is hard and difficult. And sometimes we lose some battles along the way, but we fight all the more to try to maintain what God wants us to have. Perhaps our marriages are failing because we've turned away from the book. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I believe there's a lot of answers in this book for our marriages, for our homes. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm convinced... That when we fail as fathers, when we fail as mothers, when our marriages failed, we miss something in the book. We miss something in the book. It might be something that we know, but we're not applying. And that, that, that could be very real. But when we fail many times, it's because we miss something in the book. Something that's been written down, recorded, given to us so that we can read it and we can apply it. Now, do we always apply it? No. Many times we do make mistakes. But what I find so interesting is our society, our culture, and the devil is attacking marriage, attacking fathers, attacking mothers, and and really it's being attacked by all kinds of things that are not in the book. There is all kinds of advice that I hear out there for marriages, for fathers, for mothers, that you will not find in God's word. They say, oh, this is what's best for a father. This is what a father should be doing. This is what's best for a mother. This is what a mother should be doing. This is what's best for a marriage. This is what people in a marriage should be doing. But it's not from the book. When we fail, it's because we walk away from the book. How many times have we heard, perhaps in media or the world, so many times I hear advice and I'm like, that's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. That's the exact opposite of what the Bible says, but people take it hook, line, and sinker and say, you know what, you know, let's, let's, let's bring another partner into this marriage and see how that works out. You know that that's actually kind of common within my generation, is they say, you know what, you want to spice up your marriage, bring somebody else into the marriage relationship, that'll make it real good. You know what, let's bring some pornography into the relationship, that'll make it real good. These are things that are advised by the world, they say do these things, it'll make your marriage better. Have an open relationship. Don't be faithful to one another. The home is under attack. Marriage is under attack. And when we walk away from God's word, we're in trouble. Certainly there's no perfect family. We need to do the best we can. But, but many people have just walked away from Bible principles and ideas. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, we have Jesus comparing the church as his bride. And within there, we have certain statements that are said about the relationship between the spouse and the husband. We have Jesus and his bride, and really the expectation is faithfulness. And really, we see the comparison with husbands and wives. There are some expectations for husbands, and there are some expectations for wives. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, just a little bit of what's there, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, what did Christ do for the church? 
Christ died for the church. He purchased the church with his own blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. If we have that type of love and we have that type of commitment to our spouse, I think that gets us through a whole lot of problems, difficulties, and challenges. If we have a sacrificial love. It also talks about respect. You know what? A marriage with love and respect can go a long way. That's what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. It talks about a marriage with love and respect. Sacrificial love. If you have sacrificial love, that will go a long way in a marriage. And that's what really, we look at it, that's what marriage is kind of built upon. This sacrificial love. A love that doesn't always look out for what I want, but what someone else wants. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Do not look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. And really, when you start looking at marriage and what God wanted it to be, I'm to love my wife so much that I would give my life for her. And if I was going to give my, my life for my wife, what other things would I do for my wife? I would sacrifice for my wife. I love my wife. The home is under attack. And I think the home becomes more under attack and our marriage is more uh, in jeopardy when we walk away from God's word. Our relationships are better with God's word than without God's word. And when our marriages start to fray and when they start to have problems, I suggest that the best thing to do is go back to the word and figure out what I missed. What did I miss? What did I miss? Because we have all things in the book for life and godliness and, and all those things that we can live a good life. Certainly marriage is under attack. But also I want to think about mothers for a few moments. I think mothers are under attack. Christian mothers, biblical mothers, those Christian traits that we see, I think it's under attack in many ways. And I think there's a lot of things that are said through the media that actually are attacks on the Christian wife and the Christian mother. And, you know, I find myself, in this topic, I feel like I'm preaching a little bit out of season. Because when we start looking at biblical traits of mothers, and we start looking at what the Bible says about mothers, these are the exact things that the media attacks many times about mothers, and our society attacks about mothers. <laughs> Basically, our world says mothers don't be mothers. And I, I, maybe that's a little bit too blunt, but I think that that's almost where our society has come to, is our society says mothers don't be mothers. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, if you turn on the news or anything, I think many times you see that our society says that a wife and a mother, if you're just a wife and a mother, you're a failure. You know what? The Bible says the exact opposite. A Christian wife, a Christian mother, who's focused on the home, who's watching over the home, that reads to the children the Bible, that sets the priorities of the home, that's watching over the children, that is number one in God's book is a mother is watching over those children and watching those children. And you say, well, what about dad? Yeah, dad's supposed to be there too. I'll talk about dad in a second. But Christian mothers, motherhood is under attack. When you listen to our society and our culture, they almost do everything they can, I think, many times, to try to get mom away from the kids. I think that, and like I said, I might be preaching out of season, but I think when we read the Bible, if you go to every place it talks about mother, and you read about what it says about mother, and you read about the traits that mother's supposed to have, and you start reading down through those, I think we start to see that mother is connected to the teaching of those children. And certainly father's there as well. You know, it's hard to measure, I think, sometimes a good home until later years in life. But good Christian mothers that make these sacrifices... Many times they are attacked by our community and our culture and they say they're, they're told they're doing the wrong thing. That's not what the Bible says. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5 it says, When I call to your remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it is in you also. We need Christian mothers. We need biblical mothers that are focused on the home, that are focused on the Bible, that are focused on the truth, that are focused on the priority of God and their children's lives. There's so many traits that we could reflect upon that makes a good Christian mother. In Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, I think we certainly find some of those ideas. In Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and it says, Older women, likewise, that you be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, 
that you may admonish the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now, when you look at Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, we have this idea of the older women teaching the younger women. And when you read through those traits, I think that any of us want to look through those and say, am I doing these things? Am I doing these things that it says? Are you a teacher to your children? That's what it says in Titus chapter 2, a teacher of your children. Are you a teacher of your children? I know that that can take on many forms. It says reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands. Are we teaching our daughters to love their husbands? Are we teaching our daughters to love children? I can tell you, I think that's something that's under attack in our culture. Once again, I think I might be preaching out of season, but it seems like that children are under attack. In our society, the way that my generation talks about children, they are the biggest plague you could ever have. You know what the Bible says? It says children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. You know what? I think our society has turned away from children. You just have to look at the abortion rates in our country. Children are not needed. They're not wanted. In a lot of ways, people talk about their children. They almost view them as, I wish they had a return policy. I wish I could take them back. That's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says that the children are precious and they are a blessing from the Lord. But I can feel that in our culture. I can feel it with my generation. My generation, the way they talk about children, I think is shameful. Children are a blessing from the Lord. We don't all have to have the same amount of children. <laughs> some, some people, there are all kinds of complications and, and hard challenges that people go through having children. Some people go through praying and praying and praying. There's no rule on how many children or anything like that. But you start thinking about children. The way some people talk about children is that it's like they're a curse. When really the Bible says they're a great blessing. You know, there's not a day that goes by I don't think that I don't smile and laugh. And it's because of my children. <laughs> There is always something that my children will bring a smile to my face or make me laugh. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just silly things, and then sometimes it's just the, the most precious things. Like when your kids start to say the books of the Bible. Bible, Bible. Some of those precious moments. Children are a blessing. Certainly I think that our society has run away from good foundational ideas. You know, women have a great opportunity to fill a void that God knows that, 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 that there is going to be is that good Christian women can make such a difference. And good Christian women are, are really, when you think about it, they're priceless. And I think that's what Proverbs chapter 31 talks about. It talks about a virtuous woman. And in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10, it says, Who can find a virtuous wife for his, her worth is far beyond rubies. And when you read chapter 31, you start to see all these great qualities of a good Christian woman. A good Christian woman is priceless. But you know what? Our world many times says a good Christian woman is worthless. And what a sad picture that is. Our Christian mothers have such a, a power. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, it talks about a, a wife that has an unbelieving spouse and how she could win her husband over without a word. Good Christian women have a power that, that, is, that is so underrated. A Christian mother, the, the watcher of the home, the keeper of the home, her kindness, her tenderness, her forgiveness, her grace, all of those attributes that she brings are a blessing to any home. And whenever we're missing a Christian mother, we're missing something quite special. The example of Christian mothers. Our society has been tearing mothers down for a long time. Has been pointing mothers in directions that perhaps they should not be going. And I think we can see it many times in our children. I don't know what situation you're going to find yourself in. I think that, that when we look at ourselves, we just need to do the best we can in whatever situation we find ourselves in. But what an important role mother plays in the life of the children. I also think about fathers. I think fathers have been under attack for a long time. 
You know, I can't, I, I don't watch too much TV, I'll be honest, but I can tell you, when I was watching a lot more TV, it seems like, for lack of a better term, that dad was always put across as an idiot. You know, dad's an idiot, he goes out and works, you know, mom always comes and saves the day. You know, dad just kind of sits on the couch, he doesn't do too much, you know, he just eats, he does, you know, dad doesn't do too much. I think they've been trying to tear dad down for a long time. I think they have been. You know, I think they've been trying to tear men down for a long time. I think they've been tearing down mothers. I think we can see it. They've been tearing down mothers, but they've also been trying to tear down fathers. And you know what? I think we get to a point in our society, and we look around and say, where are the good men? Where are the good men? And you know what I think happened? Is we stopped teaching our young ones to be good men. And you don't have to look too far in some of these movements we got people questioning everything now. Well, I'm a female, maybe I'm male, male, maybe female. we got all kinds of things going on, don't we? We have not taught the next generation, I think in many respects, to be men. To be what they're supposed to be. The leader of the home, many times the hero of the home. We need Christian fathers. And when you look at the statistics, it is scary when you look at it. When fathers are in the home, there's a lot of success in the home. When fathers aren't in the home, you start looking at these statistics and it just goes off the charts. The chances of your children being involved in drugs when dad is not around. The chances of your kids going to prison when dad is not around. These are statistics. This is from the world. It's not from the Bible, but I can tell you what the Bible says is dad should be there. Dad should show up. Dad should be listening. Dad should be guiding. Dad should be the leader. And I understand a lot of homes have been broken up. But I can tell you this, homes are better with dad than without dad. It's kind of like in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, it talks about elders. It says, Titus, I want you to get elders in these congregations because these, these congregations that don't have elders are lacking something. You know, homes that lack father are lacking something. Just like a congregation of Christ that lacks elders, they are lacking something. And it's an important role to fill. You know, we need teaching fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and uh, ammunition of the Lord. There's a teaching component to mom. There's a teaching component to dad. Are we there? Are we doing what we need to do? How much time are we around our kids? I think that's a scary thing. I think sometimes people don't think about it because sometimes it is hard to think about. How much time are you around your kids? And sometimes I think we realize that the world might be around our kids more than we are. What are you talking about? Well, now with iPads and iPhones and all these things, you know, your, your children are just one click away from the world. They're just one click away from the world. Are your kids around you more or are they around the world? And I'm not saying that, that we can shelter our children. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a difference between setting our kids up for failure to some degree. You know what I mean? I know my kids are going to get exposed to alcohol. There's no doubt. It's in the world all around. But there's a difference in me grabbing some alcohol and saying, hey, kids, here's some. You know? And I think sometimes we have to be careful with raising our kids. In Proverbs, it talks about not leaving a child to themselves. It says a child left to themselves will bring shame to their mother. Children need guidance. They need to be watched over. And you know what? Guidance and watching over your kids is not putting them in front of the TV. And I know that's popular and I know that's easy. And once again, I think I'm preaching out of season. But I don't think the best thing to do is hand the phone to your kid. I'm not saying my kids don't have a phone from time to time, but it's not what I try to do. <coughs> fathers have been under attack for a long time. I think that fathers have been attacked so long that fathers have really walked away from their responsibility and the leadership that they should have in the home, watching over their kids, listening to their kids. When's the last time you talked to your kids? What happened at school today? What happened at school today? What'd you learn? Because I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it desperately. You know why? Because I don't know what you've heard, and I want to hear it so I can try to be the influence that I'm supposed to be. We need fathers with courage to lead. We certainly need mothers with courage as well, but it seems like we've almost grown up, and I think we see this in this world, we have grown up men that I think lack courage, many times lack character, and they walk away from challenges. 
They walk away from challenges. They walk away from the challenge of being dad. They walk away from the challenges at the church to, be, to, uh, to grow spiritually. We walk away. we got to be careful because our society, I think in many ways, has said, Father, you're not supposed to be hero. You're not supposed to be dad. You're not supposed to be there for your kids. Just check out. You don't need to be there. What are we talking about? We're supposed to be leaders, spiritual leaders of the home. And you know what? I think the physical checking out of leadership has also turned into checking out a spiritual leadership. Well, I'm not going to take on those spiritual roles because you know what? That would be a challenge for me. That might be hard on me. You know, people don't like to ask me certain questions. Sometimes they do ask me the questions, but many times this conversation ends real short and in a hurry. When people ask me why I preach, that conversation usually doesn't go on too long. You know why? Kyle, why do you preach? Honor, obligation, responsibility, love. You know, there's a lot of things that I could do. There's a lot of things that are far easier than this. In fact, I, I think this is the hardest thing I do in my life. I really do. This is the hardest thing I do in my life. Well, Kyle, why do you do it? Honor, responsibility, obligation, sacrificial love for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why I'm here. And you know what? That's why I'm there for my kids. Honor, responsibility, obligation, sacrificial love. These are not easy things. And that's why the world walks away from so many of them. See, the conversation doesn't go too long. Because when you start talking about those terms, you realize what a challenge that is. It's a challenge. It's a challenge that has been walked by many individuals before me, and I plan to walk it to the best of my ability. Do you meet Jesus' success list? You know, you know, humans, they probably have their success list, but would you meet God's success list? And you know what? When you start looking at God's success list, He's going to start looking at spiritual things more than physical things. And many times the world tries to drag mothers into physical things more than spiritual things. The world tries to drag fathers more into physical things than spiritual things. You know what? When you think about marriages, the world tries to drag our marriages into more physical things than spiritual things. You know what? This life that we have sets many challenges before us. And the way that I've always looked at it is I will give my best. And I don't know what situation I'm going to fall into. I don't know what diseases I'll face. I don't know what struggles I'm going to face. I don't know what disasters I'm going to face. I know some that I've already been through. But all I can do is make the best choices that I can. And I've got to make those best choices with God in mind. And if I make those best choices with God in mind, I know I'll have a better marriage. I know I'll, have, I'll be a better husband. I know I'll be a better Christian. And I know I can fall into all these hard situations, but will you make the best choice? Because the devil is just waiting for you to make a wrong one. And he wants you to make the wrong one over and over and over again. Certainly we're going to fall in this life, but will you get back up? Will you get back up to have the marriage that God wants you to have? Will you get back up to be the mother that God wants you to be? Will you get back up and be the father that God wants you to be? Will you get back up and be the Christian that God wants you to be? Because the devil's trying to tear you down and bring you down. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian this morning. Understand that you've made mistakes and that the only path to forgiveness is through Jesus Christ. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way we can this morning if you come as we stand and as we sing.